English 2322 audio lecture, Old English Poetry. Your first reaction to the Old English poetry that we've looked at so far in the class, I'm guessing is, well, frankly, a kind of confusion. Uh, this poetry is, is weird. I mean, it's unusual both in subject matter and in language. It's hard to read. The story of a poem like Beowulf is easy enough to follow, certainly, but as I've already talked about, there are still lots and lots of questions about this poem. And I'm not just talking about individual lines that we might not know how to translate correctly. I'm talking about such basic information as who wrote the poem, when the poem was written, and big questions like whether Beowulf is supposed to be an admirable figure or a figure that we condemn to some degree. Well, if these questions make a poem like Beowulf difficult to understand, when we look at poems like Wolf and Eadwalker or The Wife's Lament, the problem is much, much worse. In Beowulf, at least we usually know basically what's going on. And when we can't tell what's going on just from the poem itself, we sometimes have aids of various kinds that can help us figure out the more difficult parts of the poem. So when we look at a section like the digression uh, concerning Finn and Hildebor, uh, which we talked a little bit about in the lecture in the discussion forum, now, this is a difficult part of the poem. It's, it's hard to see what it has to do with Beowulf, but even more basically, it's hard to know what's going on. Who is Finn? Who is Hildebor? Who's on what side in this part of the poem? Well, in that particular instance, we actually do have some idea what's going on, not because the poem itself is clear, but because we know this story from other um, medieval works. Uh, there's actually another poem in Old English, sometimes called The Fight at Finsburg, or The Finsburg Fragment. Uh, that that tells uh, the same basic story as the digression in Beowulf does. And so by putting those two things together, we can figure out um, what events the poet sort of assumed his audience would have already known. But with poems like Wolf and Edwalker and The Wife's Lament, um, we really don't know at all what these poems are referring to. And because so many Old English poems sort of refer to events obliquely, sort of assuming the audience can fill in the holes, um, we're at a real loss because we're not part of that original audience, and as a result, we have a real hard time filling those holes. Some of the difficulties that we have with these poems, like with Beowulf and with Cadman's hymn, have simply to do with the result of the distance in time between the language we speak and the language these poems are written in. Uh, as I've already mentioned, we, we know Old English pretty well. I mean, we can tell what, what, what individual words in Old English meant, but we often have a hard time pinning down exactly what they meant or what the connotation would have been. Sometimes words have multiple meanings, and it's hard to know which meaning is the one that we should apply in any in individual circumstance. So if we look at the first line of Wolf and Edwalker, in the translation I provided for you online, it reads, He's as good as wild game given to my folk. And in some other translations, the line is pretty similar. In one other one that I use sometimes, the first line reads, My people have been handed prey. Now, these lines are sort of... Uh, confusing to begin with. We don't know who the folk is or the people is. Uh, we don't know who the, the he, uh, the, the person that's being referred to in this line is. But really, if we look at the original language of the poem, we can see that there are even more basic difficulties than that. We're not entirely sure what the words in, those, in that line mean. Um, the Old English, if we were to translate it literally, uh, just sort of word by word, it would it would read something like this. It would read, To my people, it is as if someone has given them a gift. Well, that's very different from my people have been handed prey or he's as good as wild game given to my folk. In both of those translations, uh, this, that word gift uh, is being translated as um, uh, something that's going to be destroyed by the people. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a gift that they're going to appreciate. It's a gift they're going to consume in some way. It's as if they've been handed food uh, to eat. Obviously, if we translated it a little differently and said, it's as if my people have been given a present, or he's as good as a gift given to my people, uh, the connotation of the line is completely different. It seems like a, a positive thing that the he, whoever the he is, has been given to uh, the people, whoever they are. 
But the situation actually is even more complicated than that. That word that I'm translating now as gift can, in fact, be translated as prey, can be translated as an offering or sacrifice, which is a little closer to prey than to gift, but not exactly the same thing. A sacrifice is usually given voluntarily, for example, whereas prey is something that's hunted. So that would be a very different translation. But that word could also be translated as battle or war. And so we could read the line as something like, it's, it's as if my people have been given a battle or have been presented with a war of some kind. Well, that's a completely different reading of the line. Well, obviously, if we can't figure out what this individual word means, we're going to have a hard time figuring out how we're supposed to think about that line. And this is a really important point when we think about especially Old English, but really any work that has to be modernized or translated in some way. Um, It's it's a question that I have to deal with as a teacher all the time um, because I'm providing you with – for these really early works, that is – I'm providing you with versions of the text that aren't the original. Um, we, we can't read Beowulf in the original. We can't read Wolf and Edwalk or The Wife's Lament. And even when we get a little later into the class, it's really hard to read some of these works without some kind of help, whether it's a translation or a modernized spelling or, or sometimes things like footnotes. But any time we start offering those, uh, those translations or those, those uh, reading aids, we're interpreting the poem to some degree. In other words, we're, we're – coming up with a way we think this work should be read, or what we think it's about, or what we think it means. In a way, there is no such thing as Wolf and Edwalker, at least not now. I mean, the, perhaps originally the poem was clear enough to the audience that, that everyone who heard it or read it understood it in basically the same way. But I, I don't think that's true, by the way. But even if it was true, it's certainly not true now. Um, Even if you read the Old English, I I can read Old English, but I don't know how to translate that first line because I'm not sure whether we should think of it as a gift or an offering or a sacrifice or a prey or a battle. And as a result, whatever choice I make there when I translate that line, that's sort of dictating how I'm going to read the rest of the poem and what I think the poem is going to be about. So in a sense, rather than thinking of Wolf and Edwalker as a single unified poem. It's really a multitude of poems. Every translator, and to some degree every reader, is going to come up with a different way of reading this poem, a different way of thinking about this poem. I don't think that's a bad thing, by the way, but it is something that we should at least be aware of. Anytime we're dealing with translated works, we're sort of at the mercy of the person translating it for us. But it's not just the language that makes this poem specifically difficult for us. Um, The situation of the poem is also somewhat unclear to us, and this has to do with not the linguistic distance between modern English and old English, but rather the social distance between the modern world and the Anglo-Saxon world. There's just so many things we don't know about how people interacted with each other at this time, which is over a thousand years ago. Um, And as a result, we don't know exactly how we're supposed to understand the situation of this poem. Um, To some translators, to some readers, this poem is about a love triangle. There are possibly three figures here. The speaker, who most translators and most readers, most scholars interpret as a female. And then two males, Wolf and Eadwalker. The nature of the triangle is, is something that, that critics don't agree on. Um, so is uh, I think the most common reading is that Ed Walker is the speaker's husband and Wolf is perhaps her lover. But there are also translators and critics who have read it in exactly the opposite way, where Wolf is her husband and Ed Walker is her lover. Um, and in fact, some readers don't read it as a love triangle at all. Um, one really interesting uh, interpretation of the poem is that it's spoken by a mother, that this is a mother speaking about her son, Wolf. Uh, maybe Ed Walker's her husband, and she's speaking to Ed Walker about their shared son, Wolf, who is out in battle and who she's very concerned about. To be honest, we're not even entirely sure that the speaker is female. 
there's general agreement on that point, um, but but I have to say it's a fairly unusual situation. There's only really one other poem in Old English that that most uh, critics believe is spoken by a female, and that that is the wife's lament. That's also been assigned. Um, doesn't mean that, that it's not a female speaker. There are certainly textual cues uh, that suggest um, that that the speaker is probably a female. That there's some kind of um, well, male to female relationship, if not necessarily romantic relationship, being discussed in the poem. But I mean, really, that's that's a pretty um, loose hold we've got on the poem. If all we can say is this is a poem spoken by somebody who's probably female, who has some kind of relationship with two males, Wolf and Ed Walker. But we don't know what that relationship is. Um, obviously, there's still a lot we don't know about this poem. With a poem like The Wife's Lament, the situation is a little clearer. In this poem, we are pretty sure that the speaker is a woman. Um, the uh, the context of the poem, the, the, the way the lines read, certainly suggest that uh, when she talks about her lord, she's not just talking about this isn't a warrior speaking about his king, but rather a woman speaking about her husband or lover. And we're pretty sure what her basic problem is. She's separated from her husband. She's lamenting. Uh, in other words, she's complaining about the fact that she can't be with her husband. What we don't know is the cause of the separation. Why are they separated? And we also don't know how the husband feels about that separation. It's possible. Some readers have read it as the husband has banished her, that he has sent her away. He has decided they can't be together again, uh, possibly because of the um, uh, sort of plots and schemings of his kinsmen. But it's also possible that he has been banished, that, that he has maybe been sent away or sent himself away to try to protect her for some reason. Um, and in that case, she imagines him being solitary and friendless as well and, and perhaps missing her. And in that case, he certainly would. Um, but it's also possible that those are just her sort of longings, her desires that she wishes he felt like she did rather than believing that he feels like she does. Well, these are all questions we have to deal with. We also have to deal with things like why is she having to live in a cave under an oak tree? Is there some sort of um, symbolic significance to that locale? And, and we really just don't know. Sometimes students get really frustrated by these poems, by the fact that there's not a clear answer to the poem, by the, the, the fact that we don't know that much about them, that we have a hard time figuring out what they're about. And I understand that frustration. I think there's a natural desire to try to make sense out of things. But I would like to suggest that that the fact that we don't know exactly how to interpret the poems may not just be a failure on our part. In other words, it may not just be that we don't know enough about the language or the context, and that if we did, we'd be able to figure them out clearly. It may, in fact, be somewhat purposeful. Uh, in fact, I would suggest that that these poems may have been written in a way to foster that ambiguity. Anglo-Saxon authors loved ambiguity. And that's a word we should maybe think about a little bit. I think most of us know what the word basically means. It means that, that we're not entirely for something ambiguous. It's not entirely clear how we're supposed to think about it. But the word actually comes from uh, a Latin verb uh, that meant... Uh, well, that ambi at the beginning of ambiguity or ambiguous is the same uh, prefix that we see in ambidextrous, which means that you're both left and right-handed. Right? The root word for ambiguity uh, meant something like uh, to drive both ways. In other words, it's a path that you could go both ways on. Uh, maybe maybe a, you can think of it uh, metaphorically as sort of a fork in the road, but a fork where both sides of the fork get you somewhere. And that's the way ambiguity uh, often works. Rather than being um, uh, a negative thing, rather than being a lack of something, a lack of meaning, ambiguity can be, and I think was seen by the Anglo-Saxons as um, a greater potential for meaning. In other words, because these poems can be interpreted more than one way, they're actually richer works uh, than one that would just uh, have a very clear and, and uh, sort of laid out meaning or way of reading. 
you know, if you think about the features of Old English uh, literature that we've looked at so far, some of them do tend toward ambiguity, certainly digressions in Beowulf, uh, which I think is a feature of, of longer Anglo-Saxon poems. Um, those digressions take, a, take us away from that one clear path. But even more basic um, poetic features like kennings, for example. You remember when we discussed Cadman's hymn, we talked about kennings, which are those compound words that have a metaphorical meaning. So the um, the whale road is the sea, the, the, the road that the whales go on, in other words. Well, kennings are, by their nature... Ambiguous. In other words, they ha- they have two different meanings. They have a literal meaning, the road the whales are on, but they have a metaphorical meaning, the sea. And I think that kinnings were valuable to Anglo-Saxon poets because they they forced the reader to think about things, to think about both meanings at the same time. It's interesting to point out here that Anglo-Saxons were very fond of riddles, for example. Um, in the, the manuscript that contains both Wolf, Wolf and Edwalker and uh, The Wife's Lament, there are also a series of riddles. More than 60 riddles are contained in this manuscript. And you know, riddles, when you think of it, are, are kind of like kennings and kind of like Wolf and Edwalker to some degree in that they play with multiple meanings, that there's sort of a literal way to read it and then this other uh, more meaningful way to read it. And in fact, the riddles by their by definition don't give you the answer. You know, you have to figure out what is meant by the text. So I think that when we look at Old English literature, rather than being frustrated by our lack of knowledge, maybe we should embrace that uncertainty uh, as a feature of the literature itself. I know, speaking just personally, I like literature that makes me ask questions. I don't like texts that sort of lay out a meaning for me. I like I like to have to think about things, and I like there to be multiple ways of thinking about things. I think it's empowering uh, to readers to, to know that there are different ways of reading this poem, and you might interpret a particular work differently than I interpret it, and that that might not just be okay, but it might in fact be the very point of the poem itself. In other words, for me at least, it's these questions, these uncertainties, uh, the lack of a clear path, the ambiguity, in other words, that makes the literature worth reading. If you have any questions about the poems that we're looking at right now, please let me know. Otherwise, thanks and get back to work.